hello and welcome everyone to the Monday Morning General Podcast, where we give you the play-by-play and analysis on battles from antiquity to the 20th century. I'm Brendan, and that's Bjorn. Let's jump in. Bjorn, what's going on, man? Yeah, hey, hey, Brendan. Nice to nice to see you today. So this is going to be a, a really exciting scenario and situation which we we go through history, see some battles, some decisive things. You know, I was recently reading a, a book about a man who was trying to identify what real decisive battles in history are. And, you know, historians throughout history have, have gone through and said, oh, this was one of the most impactful battles mm-hmm. of history. And they use all sorts of different quantifications and, and qualifying uh, factors in order to make this happen. So we're kind of begin- going through this uh, on our own level and, and deciding on our own what we think to be decisive battles throughout history. Mm-hmm. But one thing that I'd like to kind of point out that should really guide us in our conversation is What was the potential impact had the battle gone a different way? You know, you can identify a decisive battle as what would have happened Mm -hmm. if like when we're talking about the Battle of Marathon, if if the Persians would have won as opposed to the Greeks, what would have happened? And I think that's a huge identifier of what a decisive battle truly Mm -hmm. is. And especially like when you go way back in history, like we're about to, you know, the butterfly effect gets a lot bigger as you go further back. Right. So like you can't even imagine what the world would be like if the Greeks had lost here. Oh, man. It's just insane. Yeah. Well, we kind of already gave away the lead. Uh, we're talking about Marathon. So most people are familiar uh, with the military history of the Greeks, you know, with the Spartans and the Battle of Thermopylae, which was made popular by Frank Miller's comic and movie The 300. But there's a lot of famous battles uh, between the Persians and the Greeks that shaped Western history. So today we're going to go back to one of the first ones, I think the first one, the Battle of Marathon. And so this is going to be a two-part series. And this is going to be how we're going to, you know, do the format for the, the show. The first part of the series, we're going to talk about the road to war, you know, the strategic things that led up to the battle. And then two weeks from now, we'll talk about what actually happened at the battle, the tactical things that happened during the battle. And we'll give you the details, the play by play. And then we'll give you our analysis uh, on what's going on with these battles, you know, both at the strategic level and then at the tactical level as well. So first, we want to give you some background on who Persia and Greece were uh, before the Greco-Persian. So let's talk about Persia first, Bjorn. Yeah. So Persia, you're looking, it's about 500 BC. So we're what, 2,500 years Mm -hmm. ago. Uh, The Persian Persian Empire, it's this young empire, but it's massive. Mm -hmm. All right. It's massive. It spans most of Anatolia, which is today's modern age, modern Turkey uh, into Iran, we're, we're finding a lot of mm-hmm. a lot of territory, which then also means a lot of diversity. Mm-hmm. When when we're talking about the the Greeks, they're all going to be a very uh, similar ethnic background, same languages mm-hmm. that they speak, the same very similar forms of government. But throughout all of the Persian Empire, you're going to see massive differences, and that's something to keep an eye out when we talk about the soldiers mm-hmm. who are going to be uh, who are going to be fighting on the Persians. So let's talk about that geographic landmass, right? So. At 500 BC, Darius the Great is the leader of Persia. And after he took control of Persia, he went on this huge conquest spree. Uh, So he went and did military campaigns into Egypt, into the Indus Valley. And then in 513, he went to Scythia and conquered lands in Eastern Europe. You know, a campaign that crossed the Bosphorus, moved across modern day Ukraine, and then ended at the Volga River in modern day Russia. Think about like where the seat of the Persian Empire was in Iran, you know, modern day Iran. And he went to Egypt and back to India and then up into the Balkans and then across Ukraine into modern day Russia and then back again. Darius was all over the place in the Near East. Yeah, his Essentially, his his empire uh, spanned about 20 percent of the known mm-hmm. world at that time. So Bjorn, we didn't I didn't get this down in the notes, but I think the, the Persian Empire at this point was the largest empire geographically that we've seen up to this point in history. Uh, yeah. So unless you're talking about potentially some uh, some Asian uh, empires, maybe within China mm-hmm. area at the time, you know, Chinese history goes back to 5000 mm-hmm. BC. So there could potentially be some empires within that, that, that may be similar in size, but this is going to be one of the largest that we've seen up yeah. to now throughout all of world history. So throughout all these campaigns, right, Darius is conquering into all these places. What comes with campaigning is revolts, right? So uh, between all these campaigns, Darius was going back and having to deal with revolts that were against him and the Persian rule. And so very important to the story is a revolt that actually kicked off the Greco-Persian War. But before we talk about that critical revolt, let's talk about what's actually happening over in Greece. Our main character here on the on the, on the the Greek side is Athens, right? And, Ath- and Greece is 
ton of different city states, right? We have Athens, we have Euboea, Sparta, Thessalonia, Corinth. We can name a ton of different city states, but for this story, it's mostly Athens that we're going to be talking about. And so at the beginning of the 500s, Athens had, Athens had just started to experiment with, with democracy, which didn't last. 30 years after they started, their democracy fell to a tyrant named Pisiostratus. And by all accounts, he was very powerful and he made Athens wealthy and very powerful as a city state. And the other thing to talk about here too is tyrant is a different word today than it used to be back in antiquity, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean that he was a, a ruthless killer. Uh, it just means that he was a singular leader, almost like more king-like than like a dictator. But he like was controlling the, the government. But, you know, as what happens... The, the good things never last, right? right? They, they never do. You know, kings die and they leave their kingdoms to shitheads. And this shithead's name was Hippias. Uh, also note, we are... <laughs> not Greek. So we were going to murder all these names. Hippias established actual dictatorship uh, that was extremely unpopular. And so a part of that, the, so the Spartan king at the time helped the Athenians overthrow Hippias and installed a pro-Spartan oligarch named Isagoras. Isagoras would then be overthrown by Clisthenes and the pro-democratic Athenian citizens. Started with democracy, went back into tyranny and dictatorships, and then back into democracy. Cleisthenes uh, would fully entrench democracy as an Athenian institution and, you know, give us the, the real start of, like, you know, Western civ under democracy. So not, to say the least, the 500s for the Greek, uh, the Athenians was not a pretty picture don't. of civil unrest, mm -hmm. overthrowing mm -hmm. a tyrant, overthrowing mm -hmm. another dictator, civil unrest mm -hmm. all over the place. Finally, democracy takes hold. And it's a democracy that's different than mm -hmm. what we see it here in the United States today. Um, every free man is able to vote. You have to be present uh, on the day of the mm -hmm. vote to cast your vote. You get a rock. You put a rock in mm -hmm. a pile. The pile with the most rocks yep. wins. Yeah, it was like you know, our you know in America, our government is representative, and I think this was definitely more of like like a real democracy where every free man was voting. So one thing to note, though, out of this democracy was they didn't just elect the leader of Athens. Uh, the people of Athens also elected strategoi or generals. And then these were based off of representative districts, basically. So they split Athens into 10 different areas. And then each of those areas had a general that was elected to lead the military. So these weren't necessarily like well-trained people, maybe some like we've seen the civil war in, in America, right? Where it's a lot of like political people and, you know, maybe business people that have a lot of uh, influence and pull with the government mm -hmm. and they're getting elected by a popular vote, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean that these are all top tier uh, military trained generals. Yep. And it's also probably not uh, too hard to connect the dots here. Ten strategoi. Uh, strategoi is ancient Greek for strategy. Mm -hmm. That's where it comes from. So essentially, according to the Greeks, general's main job is strategy. Or that's why they call them strategoi. Mm -hmm. And then typically those generals or strategoi would be uh, commanding ab about a thousand hoplites. So they, that's how that usually broke down. And then the rest of Greece uh, still organized into independent city-states with a very different various forms of government. Most don't play a role in this conflict. Uh, one thing I will say about Sparta, they are led by a king and they were doing Spartan things during this time. So they weren't necessarily, they weren't very much involved in this. They'll come, there's a little bit of a story here for them, uh, but for the most part, it was Athens that was leading the charge here against the Persians. All right. Another big piece. Now, of like before we get into, yeah, before we get into kind of the, the reason why this whole conflict establishes itself, but the, the Greek city-state system and the way it worked is when a city state or when an area got too large, they would basically pack up their friends and say, see you later, establish a colony mm -hmm. somewhere else. And then that colony would then become another mm -hmm. city state, another independent Greek city state mm -hmm. with the same form of culture. But uh, it would, in fact, lead itself, govern itself until we see some expansion by the Persians later on. Yep. And that, that expansion was basically due to the amount of arable land available, right? Like very ancient forms of farming, right? Not able to turn much of that, uh, that rough Greek landscape into farm areas. So they quickly filled up all the arable land and had to, yep, basically ship Greek citizens across the Mediterranean to set up colonies to basically feed Greece. And this kind of started way, even further back at 750 BC, Greece started to go into colonies, right? So we're talking about colonies in Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey. Not only Asia Minor, but also you're seeing like Syracuse over in Sicily mm -hmm. along the Mediterranean. Yep. There's, you know, we'll, we'll potentially talk later on in a different episode about why uh, Roman history has and Latin history has kind of taken over uh, where Greek history could have could have happened. But the Greeks, essentially, they went all mm -hmm. over the place 
within that Mediterranean Asia Minor, area. Cyprus, the Black um, Sea, all the way up Minor. the Aegean, into Italy, Everything. southern France, and even some Greek colonies out into Spain, even. Uh, so, like, that's the whole yeah, Mediterranean, basically. Yep. <laughs> all right. So, we want to specifically talk about Ionia, though. Uh, that's what's important to the story with uh, the Battle of Marathon. So, right about the 700s, after losing territory to the Doric Greeks on Peloponnesus, the Ionic Greeks left and sought refuge in Athens. Lacking space there, the Athenian king at the time resettled these Ionian Greeks in Anatolia in what came to be known as Ionia. So Anatolia is another name for like Western Turkey, you know, that Asia Minor area. So basically we see Ionic Greeks moving from the Spartan area into Athens and then into Anatolia, which they then became a colony called Ionia. Ionia, very prosperous. Uh, Miletus uh, became one of Greece's most important commercial cities. And then about 700, these Greek colonies start uh, coming under the rule of Lydia. Uh, which is another uh, empire that had taken over in the Asia Minor area um, with complete control of Lydia over Ionia happening about 560 to 545. And then uh, the Persian king Cyrus, uh, who preceded, is preceded before or after? Preceded Darius? Came before Darius. Uh, he conquered. <laughs> He's, yeah, yeah. Come before. So King Cyrus uh, came before Darius. Uh, he conquered Lydia and Ionia right about 547 BC. But these city-states actually had a lot of autonomy from Persia. They only were su subject to a Greek tyrant who was then subject to a Persian satrap. A satrap would be like a governor, basically. So they had a governor that was a part of, that that controlled Western Turkey. And then that governor then controlled um, this uh, Greek tyrant who ran basically the Ionian colonies. And usually the way that these ancient empires would have worked is, you know, you've got your, your satrap, mm -hmm. you've got your Persian governor, but Essentially, you provide some form of taxation to the emperor, mm -hmm. uh, some sort of some sort of allegiance, showing that you you're providing this allegiance, but also potentially providing soldiers right. to his army if you should need it. Otherwise, you're, you're kind of on your own to mm -hmm. do your own thing. Because mm -hmm. remember, we're talking thousands of miles, and the fastest method of transportation is via a horse. Right. And at this point in time, they don't even have stirrups mm -hmm. on their horses. Yeah, it's not even really ships because they can't get ships to the Mediterranean from from Iran or Persia, right? So like it, oh, it yeah. is horse only right. and walking across yep. the Middle East. So they're going to have a lot less, a lot less uh, kind of organization from a higher up perspective. You you provide some taxation, you provide some soldiers and levies. Otherwise the day-to-day -day is on your own, which in fact may lead to spurring some civil mm -hmm. unrest or some easier ways of people saying, hey, these guys aren't looking, let's do our mm -hmm. own thing. So let's talk about the Ionian Revolt. So at the time, the Persians had a satrap in Ionia or in Asia Minor uh, named Artaphernes. And then in 499 BC, the tyrant of Miletus, the city that we talked about earlier, that was a very large commercial success. Uh, his name was Aristagoras. He launched a joint expedition with the local Persian satrap Artaphernes to conquer the neighboring region of Naxos. Naxos was a very commercial based island, a lot of trade happening through there, but Naxos was ready for the siege. So four months later, Aristagoras and Artaphernes have to return home uh, financially ruined and defeated. And so this puts Aristagoras in between what we call a rock and a hard place, right? So after the failed evasion, he couldn't repay his debts to Artaphernes. And then he became uh, very alienated from the Persian court, which is not a place to be when you are the tyrant of a place that, you know, uh, has authority, a uh, Persian authority over you. Because he had uh, become alienated and can't pay his debts, like seeing his demise imminently happening, he decides to rebel against the Persian king Darius. And he is able to bring... So this, is this like a, this is like a Hail Mary? Like, a, like yeah. I know I'm... Like I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting shunned by the Persians yep. here. Things aren't looking good for me. If I'm going to retain my status in any way, shape or form, I have to potentially uh, lead this revolt, become the king of a city state, find mm -hmm. some new friends, do something to retain a high position of power before being sent into potentially exile right. or something to that fact. You know, it's like human nature. Like once you have power and money and influence, it is very hard to give that up. You want to keep it at all costs. And so Aristagoras comes up with this plan to bring all of Greek Asia Minor into revolt. Uh, but he knows he needs more help. He can't just do it with his local forces in Ionia. So first he calls up Sparta. They say, no thanks, bro. But Athens and Eritrea both sign up onto this revolt. So in the spring of 498 BC, this Greek coalition of Ionia, Athens, and Eritrea marches to the capital of the satrapy, which is in Sardis. A pretty, it's not super far, but it's, it's inland in Turkey. 
Uh, so that is where Artaphernes' court is set up. The Greeks are able to capture the lower city pretty quickly, but they were unable to seize the citadel. So, you know, it's a walled fortress, which is the citadel, and then, a, you know, markets and hobbles and like, you know, the where the common people all live. The Greeks are able to capture that pretty quickly, but they can't get to the, the walled fortress of the citadel. Because they're in like this like lower, you know, it's not a nice area. It's a market. There's a lot of wood and cloth and a lot of flammable things that starts on fire. So a fire erupts and spreads throughout the entire lower city. And then surrounded by fire and Greeks, uh, the Persians leave the citadel fighting with the Greeks and then forcing a retreat. So the Greeks had initially... So the, the the Persians essentially sally forth outside of their their citadel and and they actually break through the, the Greek mm-hmm. lines? Like they're pushing these Greeks out? Yep, yep exactly. You know, I, I, there's a lot of Persians there. The Greeks are not as well-equipped or trained like they will be in future conflicts that we're going to talk about next episode, the Battle of Marathon. Like, I don't think they're able to set up the phalanx, you know, especially when these uh, Persians start, you know, flowing out of the fortress. I, they just don't have time to form up. And so they right. route pretty quickly. Well, and and when you're when you're talking about throughout history, when when units see some form of success initially, uh, they take over an enemy's camp, they take over an enemy's city. And the first thing that these soldiers who are generally underpaid and potentially hungry, the first thing that they end up doing is running through the streets, uh, stealing things, looting, mm-hmm. grabbing whatever they can find. And that leads to a large amount of disorder. Usually when we see major upsets in battles, like what we just saw here with the Greeks have the advantage, the Greeks are pushing through, capturing, destroying. Uh, all of a sudden the Persians now have the upper hand. Usually these massive swings in fortune occurred due to a lack of organization or at some point in time, the Greeks lost their cohesion. The Persians were able to take advantage of that due to their uh, really, I mean, let's be real, they're in a situation that is not ideal. And so as a result of that, they had to break out and their cohesion, their organization trumped the the, the Greeks uh, in this scenario and were able to push them back. Yep. That initial Greek success taking the lower city is followed by a major defeat of coalition forces at the Battle of Ephesus. The Greeks had routed away from Sardis and they get to the town of Ephesus. The Persians are able to follow quickly. The Greeks are on foot. The Persians are primarily a cavalry force and that force was very effective against the retreating Greeks. Uh, that Persian cavalry is primarily missile based, right? So they're using archers and arrows and they're able to uh, have a pretty sound victory at Ephesus, um, which basically ends the revolt. That doesn't, that doesn't sound good for, for Miletus, right? The leader of this rebellion not, for the Greeks, it does not sound good uh, for him at all. That, that doesn't bode well for him. No. What happens to him? What happens to the rest of this? Well, okay. So at the end of the revolt, so we just talked about like the primary offensive of the revolt, of the revolt, but the revolt does spread. Uh, the Persians have some defeats. There's some stalemates. The Ionians lose uh, their fleet in battle. Boom, goes the dynamite. Miletus falls and the rebellion is at essence over. And then Persia spends the next couple of years mopping everything up and reestablishing uh, control. I actually don't have a note about what happened to Aristagoras. I'm assuming nothing good. I think he had to go back to Greece like to survive. And I don't think he had a very good life after that. This is fun. So after the revolt, everything's got cleaned up. Darius vows to punish Athens and Eritrea for their support of the revolt. He's already taken care of Ionia. And now he's got his eyes, he's got those Persian eyes set on uh, Athens and Eritrea. Herodotus, which is also the main source of all of this. Um, you know, he, he's a... The, like the first historian, right? A Greek historian. And then he he writes about these events uh, decades after they happened. Uh, but Herodotus tells a story about how Darius shoots an arrow into the sky and pledges his vengeance on Athens to the gods. And then I love this part. So he's a king, right? So he's going to have dinner. It's going to be served to him. Darius tells one of his servants to remind him this and tell Darius this three times a day before dinner, every single day. Master, remember the Athenians. So every day before dinner, you know, he's going to get his pizza, he's going to get chicken wings, and he's going to be thinking about Athens the entire time. This guy's a serious grudge holder. Like, goodness gracious. He's put down the rebellion. He's victorious in the fact that he's still the king. He's still in charge. He's conquered what he had lost. And yet it's not Uh enough. He's got a grudge. He's going to take him down. So how does he do that? So. Who knows if this actually happened, right? Like Herodotus is telling us a story. Uh, he is not, he's the first historian, but not necessarily like the best historian in the world, right? So like uh, there's a lot of probably narrative that's put in here. There's definitely some Greek bias, right? Like Herodotus is trying to sell books, right? So he's got to tell a really good story. So what better story than to have, you know, the the big bad evil guy say, we're going to come get you. I'm not going to forget about you. Athens, you're next, right? That's a good story. 
That's an awesome yeah. story. I'd yeah. buy that book. A lot of people bought the book. Uh, very famous histor- <laughs> historical writing. The first thing that Darius does, he's been reminded about all this. He decides to invade Greece in 492 BC. His first campaign, it's led by Mardonius. He resubjugates Thrace and he forces Macedon uh, to become a fully subordinate clan kingdom of Persia. So Thrace and Macedon are both in the northern part of Greece. You know, if you're thinking about mainland Greece, like they're in the north part, you know, where Alexander is going to come from in the future. Uh, I wonder where Alexander gets all of his hatred for the Persians, uh, probably at, you know, he remembers back to this time or, you know, he hears stories about this time of uh, being under the subjugation of, of Persia. They conquer Thrace and Macedonia Mar- or Macedon at this time. Uh, so Mardonius, then he's the one that's leading this campaign, sails his fleet down, uh, trying to get to Athens and, you know, and get revenge for his boss. Mardonius's fleet was destroyed in a storm. And this happens all the time in antiquity. Like fleets go out and, you know, we're going to go do the naval thing and then just lost. You know, storm comes up and boom, yeah, these boats- all gone it's nuts and you these are huge like these boats these triremes these quireme's they've got a lot of yeah. dudes rowing these yeah. boats and all of a sudden boom they're yeah. all sunk in a storm and and the you, the historians tell you that there was a hundred thousand yeah. sailors who died and you're just like oh my goodness gracious the thing to keep in mind though with these triremes for the most part they're like basically like a big canoe Right. Like it's not like multiple story like we think of a naval ship today. Right. It's like a big canoe. There might be like two levels on it, but, you know, it's pretty easy to get those things full of water. And then, you know, especially you got waves rocking and storm going like, yeah, it's pretty easy for these things to uh, end up at the bottom of the Aegean. The fleet's destroyed, but Darius does send ambassadors uh, to all parts of Greece. He requires submission. He receives submission from everybody but Sparta and Athens. Uh, Both of those. Which that tells you that tells you how spectacular uh, of a reputation well, right. Darius had of uh, the size of his army. If all he has to do is send a dude who's like, Hey, just so you know, you have to submit right now, uh, sign the dotted line, or we're going to destroy you whenever, yeah. you know, like what is the timeline mm-hmm. on this? The, the fear that these guys must've been feeling is just a massive, but it also kind of shows you the balls of Sparta and Athens, right? Like this is the famous part in uh, the movie 300 when King Leonidas <laughs> does a drop kick on the dude into the well, right? Darius does not take that very well. So Sparta and Athens both executed the ambassadors, right? Like it's like, hey, I'm just a messenger. Don't kill me. But they do. So they don't uh, They don't go under subjugation, which makes uh, Darius not happy. That was in 492 when the Mardonius campaign happened. Darius is like, all right, we're going to do this again. So two years later, in 490 BC, Darius sends an expedition led by Artaphernes, uh, who was the satrap of Asia Minor that was a part of the Ionian Revolt. Uh, he gets to lead this expedition and another man named Datus to bring the Cyclades, uh, which is an island group off the southeast coast of Greece in the South Aegean. So they're going to go and take over or uh, try to take over this island called Cyclades. And they bring it into the Persian fold. And then basically from there, take this island and then go and force Athens and Eritrea into submission under Persia. So that summer of 490 BC, Persia successfully attacks Naxos in the Cyclades. But Naxos was the island that we talked about in the Ionian Revolt. So they are finally conquered by the Persians. And then from there, they sail to Eritrea where they besiege the island and capture and burn the town. Persia has now gotten revenge on Eritrea for their part in the Ionian Revolt. All that is left is Athens. So from there, the Persians sail down the coast and land their army on the beaches of Marathon, 17 miles northeast of Athens. And Bjorn, that will wrap up our discussion, setting up the Battle of Marathon. Uh, so next episode, we're going to dive into the strategy and tactics of the battle. So like, what do you think about that? I, I'm still just looking at this like... From a first, you've got this great revenge story, and yeah, Herodotus is probably uh, embellishing a little bit when he talks about how often to be reminded of this. But obviously, you as an emperor or a king, you're not going to mobilize and expend this sort of treasure and manpower if you don't have a grudge. Or he, you know, he already controls twenty percent of the known mm-hmm. world. What is he trying to get at if he doesn't have this thirst for revenge? So- but, you know, I think he is a, he is a pretty advanced leader too, right? So I think he sees there's a lot of monetary gain to be had in Greece, right? Like there's a lot of trade happening here. Uh, they are very influential in the rest of the Mediterranean, right? So like you take Athens, Sparta, and the rest of the Greek city-states, well, then you basically just took all the colonies too, right? Because those colonies are providing taxes back to the main the main city states in Greece, right? So you take mainland Greece, you now control the Mediterranean. Like there is literally nobody else 
in the sea that is blocking Persian rule, right? So you take Greece, you open up the gate to the rest of the Mediterranean, you know, Italy, Spain, France, and then into like the very rich areas of Northern Africa, where it become much easier for him to to reach. So I think there's a lot of like strategic and economic reasons that Darius would, you know, try to set up a, a satrap within the Greece mainland and then, you know, the nice revenge story on top of it. Well, and to your point where you're talking about there is nothing else. I mean, at this point in time, the the future emperor empire of Rome is just a fledgling little city mm-hmm. state. Uh, they're, they're very little. They're still, you know, they're making some waves there in Italy, but they're nothing. Yeah. So when you're talking about the potential you know, of, of everything they could have accomplished here had and if they were to capture and, and take over Athens and the, the Greek areas, I mean, we're talking a difference of the Greek culture that has that is so profoundly played its way into our modern society. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about the Greek playwrights? What about the Greeks? form of sculpture, the arts, democracy. the culture of, of what is Greece, the democracy. Right. What does modern day democracy right. look like if their fledgling democracy had died on the sands there mm-hmm. at Marathon? Mm-hmm. It's it's almost infa- it's inconceivable to think of the, how different this, this world would right. be had the right. Persians won. And that is something that I'm very much looking forward to discussing yeah. next time. Yeah. It's just like, could, like I don't see Rome growing and expanding like it does, right? If Persia is right there in Greece, and you know, and to think Persia would stop expanding at Greece is uh, asinine, right? Like they would continue expanding West, like what, what with what Rome did later, right? So um, I don't think we see like anything from Alexander the Great. We don't see the Roman Empire expanding. You know, we might see Carthage expand more, like Carthage might have more influence now because that other empire is so far away. Um, so that could, that would potentially be something interesting, but like, we're talking about like a completely different world if Persia is successful in marathon. Yeah. You're replacing the Latin influence that we have today, the Greek and Latin influence with Persian right. influence life. It would have been completely and utterly different for today here in 2023. Yeah. And like, but then you talk about like, could Persia have uh, expanded into Germany, the UK, you know, Northern France, Spain, like Rome did, right? And so like Rome expands and puts that influence into the rest of Europe leading into, you know, the middle age Europe uh, that we're, that we'll definitely be talking about in the future. But like, does Persia have the ability to put their empire out that far? Maybe not. Right. So then do we even see a development of European culture at like the extent that we have? I don't, I don't think so at all. It's, it's one of those, this, this is what I love so much about history is you take a look at what could have been and how things could have been different. And that's why this has to be, you know, many historians have said that this is a very, very uh, decisive and important battle throughout history. It's on the list of many historians, um, but then it, it's on a, it's not on a couple historians lists of, of important battles in history. But I would say that here's a fork in the road. Mm-hmm. Uh, one way the Greeks win and the world looks like it does today. The other way mm-hmm. the Persians win and the world looks completely and utterly different. Well, Bjorn, I think this is a good place to end. This was a good conversation. So this was a lot on the strategy side. Next, uh, next episode, two weeks from now, we're going to dive into, actually, I think we're going to put these out pretty close together. So you're actually probably just listening to the next one now, but a lot more tactical. We're going to talk about like what actually happened at the battle, how the armies arrayed themselves, what type of equipment they have, what the soldiers look like, and then like what actually happens, like the phases of the battle. So I'm excited to talk about that with you. And then let's, I think we just close it out. Thanks everyone for listening. Uh, Make sure you hit that subscribe button. And we hope to be talking to you a lot more about uh, the famous battles of our history. So catch you on the other side. Bye.